certainly took me by surprise. It was like nothing I'd ever read before. It, uh, of course, was David Cronenberg, so I had been forewarned what to expect, but I don't know that you can be prepared for a Cronenberg script. It was literally the best script I've ever read just because it was it was almost like a novel. You'd read it and it was like having a nightmare. You, you just couldn't put your foot on any reality because it would change the next couple of pages and it was just such a visceral experience to read it. I just remember being incredibly impressed by the initial draft of the script. I mean, I was reading it like with my mouth open and thinking, How, he, he can't make this movie, you know? And then and it was kind of like, how are we going to do this stuff? Uh, but I just remember just thinking it was very, very creative and, 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 and original and very twisted. And, and like, so I couldn't wait to really see how, how David was going to approach that. And, to the extent that my films and their imagery appeals to, to the unconscious, to that extent my films are subversive of society because society functions on the level of repression and order and my films deal with what happens when repression and order uh, break down. That's going to be so, so chilling about this film is it's going to be so natural and then all of a sudden it's going to kind of melt into this abyss of horror and, and strangeness, you know? And at the same time, there's this, at the same time, it's funny, I can't explain it. It's a very odd style that I think is gonna work like gangbusters somehow. David Cronenberg was five years old when television first entered North American homes. Kids were warned by nervous parents not to sit too close. Back in those early days, nobody knew what this spooky new radiation might be capable of doing to young eyes or minds. The television screen, has become the retina of the mind's eye. It's getting hard to remember a time when the world wasn't filled with video cameras and television wasn't filled with real people on reality TV. But back when David Cronenberg was assembling his team to create Videodrome, TV had been around for a little more than a generation and was still firmly in the control of advertisers, network programmers, and censors. There was no HBO, no Showtime, no DVDs, no Criterion Collection. Back then, home video was still so new, networks and studios were busily suing manufacturers, trying to force them to remove the record buttons from their VCRs. My name is Michael Lennick, and way back in an earlier century, I was privileged to be one of three effects supervisors on David Cronenberg's Videodrome. That's me in Harlan's Bootleg Video Lab, a set my team filled with equipment and detritus from our own basement labs. My partners, Lee Wilson, Rob Meckler, and I, were in charge of the film's video effects and imagery. The job called for plenty of quick and dirty in-camera trickery, combined with the latest in early 80s digital effects. Whatever it took to assist David in realizing his ever-mutating vision, and help Max Wren hallucinate a brand new world of low-res weirdness. Our mandate was anything having to do with video, from optical effects to producing the film's mini TV sequences. We even had to figure out how to waterproof a television set or two in order to help ensure a safe environment in which to shoot a very ambitious script. Videodrome was shot in Toronto during the late fall of 1981. There was very little preparation time. In those days, Canadian film projects often came with rock-solid cutoff dates. And in this case, the production window was so limited that David was forced to start shooting without a finished script. Here we go. One of the requirements was that the, the funds had to be spent in the calendar year. So with all of the delays in getting financing and production together, and the cameras finally started rolling in October, we had to basically go like stink to get it all done by Christmas. I don't believe there was ever a complete, completed screenplay on that, on that film until very late in the proceedings. And uh, uh, we, we managed to move forward with, without it. And um, uh, David was writing as he went along. And uh, I think the major elements were in place in terms of the story, but the actual screenplay, uh, I, I don't know if I'd be going too far, too far to say it was never completed, but uh, certainly when we went into production, it was, uh, it was probably uh, you know, seven-eighths or three-quarters of a script. 
Working alongside Frank Carreri's physical effects unit, our main job was to help support the incredible creations of Rick Baker and his makeup effects team. Rick had been working at his trade for nearly 10 years by then, and had been practicing for his career since childhood, inspired by the many famous monsters of Filmland. Well, if you just picture me the way I am now, without gray hair and, uh, and eye bags, it was, <laughs> I was pretty much the same as a kid as I am now. I was a strange kid, I'm a strange old man, you know. I'm an only child, I grew up in my bedroom, which was my makeup laboratory, and I liked monster movies, and. I like making stuff and pushed my clay around and and you know painted things and and thought you know that would why don't I make monsters for a living people somebody has to do that and uh, was lucky enough to have it all work out. When Videodrome came along, Rick had just completed the breakthrough effects that would win him the first ever Academy Award for special makeup, his first of many. Most of his very young team accompanied him as he set up shop in Toronto. I think I was 18, maybe 19 at the time, and it was just after American Werewolf, so I was, uh, Rick really was like a second dad. It was, it was amazing because coming from college and high school where it's kind of like, you know, can I, can I turn that paper in a week late? Okay. And, you know, everybody talks about the movie business being for flakes, and my first experience was Rick, and I'd kind of go, well, is this okay? And he'd go, no, do it again and do it another time and do it, do it until it's perfect. You know, it was a real wake up call for uh, being in the real world. And Rick, Rick was great about it. I mean, he, he really took the time to, to show you exactly how it was right, but he just wouldn't accept it unless it was perfect. Their average age was 23, and they were in charge of creating some of the most disturbing imagery ever put on film. It made perfectly good sense to us that they were also the happiest, most cohesive effects team we'd ever worked with. You know, we were all excited to be working on a movie and, and to be able to make some cool stuff. I mean, I, I was married, but my wife worked with me, and, and we didn't have much of another life other than our work, so we worked day and night. I mean, we, uh, you know, go to the shop in, in the morning and stay there till you know, late at night and making our monsters and having fun doing it, you know. And, and I really felt kind of like, because, I mean, I was a number of years older than these guys. I was kind of a surrogate father in a way, you know, and, and I kind of thought of these guys as my kids, you know, and we, and we you know, socially, I mean, they're the only people we saw during those years when we were working because that's all we did was work. We've never done any, any effects quite like we're doing in video drum. Uh, for example, we have, we're doing a makeup effect on a TV set. We have a, a like a change of TV, similar to what we did in, American Werewolf, where he had a guy's face change and stretch and, and so on, and in this case, it's a gigantic television console that that, that becomes flesh and grows veins and, and musculature and it moves and undulates and undulates and all kinds of horrible things happen to it. It's uh, like doing makeup on a prop kind. Of. It was basically you do one layer, and then you'd wait for it to go off to solidify, and then you had to do this meticulous little vein painting after that and then you do another layer and you had to do that for four sides and if any of the layers didn't work then you had to redo the whole thing so it was it was quite meticulous and and uh, I think we went through four or five TVs that got to the last section and then the last section didn't work and we had to redo the whole thing. I, I remember Videodrome fondly. I remember uh, also just being impressed by David's thinking. I mean, he's definitely out there with the stuff he th thinks up and, 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 and comes up with. And, and uh, but he doesn't look the part. You know, when you know, after having seen uh, Rabbit and some of the stuff that David did before I met him, you know, I expected him to be like, like Peter Lorre, you know, or something, you know. And and, uh, uh, and he was not at all like that. Yeah, so he was he, he was an interesting man. Underneath this civilized veneer, we have one of the strangest minds I think I've ever encountered, you know, in, in the world of writing and film. He didn't seem like the kind of guy that would make video drum, so I guess that's a compliment. I mean, David just seems like there's somewhere inside him that he gets these great ideas from, but he's steady enough in the rest of his being that he can actually make a movie that makes sense to people out of it. So. There's a there's a definite creative well there, but he's also pragmatic enough so he can make it work. That's really hard to find, it seems like. Yeah, and Jimmy, yeah. when you uh, when he says you'll see more on that monitor, 
don't just walk to it like. No, what I'm doing. What, no, what I was doing was I'm watching on this, and, and I know it's going to come on. I don't want to miss it, so I stay yeah. glued to that, and then jump yeah. over to the next yeah, one. Yeah, but it's just you. Were, it was just into, you were just heading for it like you knew it all along. Yeah, yeah. I want one of those. This wasn't what I was. David was amazing. David is uh, not a demanding individual. It was more like this is what I want to portray. How can you help me? Uh, which, as a technician, uh, you can't ask for a lot more than that. As production raced along through its ever-mutating schedule, the three effects units found new ways to help each other out. Rick's team had always used simple cable and air pressure controls, a hands-on approach that let them puppeteer real performances from their latex appliances. But it would take something more to animate their toughest challenge, a living, breathing television set that would become one of the film's central images. With its many throbbing veins and muscles, the TV was far too large and complex for the team's usual approach. And then somebody had an inspiration. Frank Carrera, who was the, the floor effects guy, saw the kind of Mickey Mouse thing that we made to, to operate our TV. If I remember correctly, we just had a, you know, a piece of metal or plastic or something with a bunch of holes in it with a bunch of tubes stuck in it. And I think we were just going to run an airline over this thing, kind of like a harmonica, you know, run an airline over it to make things inflate. And Frank uh, said, well, you know, I can make a keyboard. I can get an old, you know, synthesizer or something, take the keyboard and, and hook it up to some, you know, little solenoids and, and valves and make a thing when you push a key that it, you can inflate it, which sounded great to me. It sounded a lot more controllable than, you know, blowing air through a, you know, a harmonica with tubes coming out of it, you know. Um, you know, because I also think we were just blowing in them too, you know, and you get, you get pretty dizzy after a take blowing in this tube and trying to blow up a big TV set. It was something that had evolved. I was trying to figure out how I could control the maximum number of switches with my hands and then would I need two people, three people, or four people, uh, or more. Um, I went into Steve's Music and I asked if they had an old keyboard kicking around, took the whole thing back, set up a couple of valves and uh, compressor, vacuum pump, and took a pass at it. There was a lot of tweaking, but Rick seemed um, uh, very happy with, with the results. So we went ahead and every night after we finished shooting for a good week or 10 days, I stayed late just to work on the keyboard. And uh, ultimately it gave us the control that we needed. So Frank made this great keyboard thing, which I was really impressed by. And, and um, it was very helpful that, uh, that he came up with that. And, and I think he also came up with somebody who could actually play a keyboard as to, to help us operate it, you know. So I think the, the person was playing a Toccata and Fugue in, in a G minor, and that, that's what made that thing work. So. effects units would come together for one of the script's trickiest sequences, a scene that called for Max to physically join with the image on his TV. After experiments with liquid gelatin blue screens and other dead ends, the solution turned out to be a film clip shot off a television screen, then rear projected through an airtight plexiglass chamber that could be inflated with a bellows. I, I remember that being effective, that scene where, where he's like, uh, basically making love to his television set, you know, with big Debbie Harry lips coming out, you know. And, uh, this dental dam that we use, which is this, this rubber that dentists use, actually, uh, but it was one of the first rear projection screen materials that they used. I think that's what they used in King Kong, uh, uh, big sheets of dental dams. So. And it was, a, it was a nice kind of sensual thing that he could caress and it would you know, respond. More than anything about Videodrome, I just remember trying to figure out, you know, what the hell these things were going to be. You know, I mean, it, it wasn't like your typical uh, makeup effects movie. I mean, it wasn't making somebody a zombie or some kind of monster. It was making a TV, a flesh living thing, or a video cassette alive, and this handgun that shoots cancer. You know, it's like all these weird things that came out of David's mind. And David, of course, I don't know if you know this, but David Cronenberg writes from his nightmares. He only writes at night. He doesn't write during the day. From time to time, images from time to time have come to me in, in, in sleep, sometimes on the set when I'm asleep. 
if we, if we ever think about nightmares, the thing about them that's so horrifying is not that some terrible thing happens all of a sudden. It's that something is normal and I'm talking to you and all of a sudden my hand starts to explode or you know, turn green and, and you're talking, you know, in a nightmare it seems to be normal but there's something you sense is wrong and it's the emotional terror, the, the almost subliminal terror as opposed to a logical terror. You know what I'm saying? That kind of thing where this is not right. What's wrong with this picture? I remember we had a real problem with shrinkage especially and it was real obvious in the scene where, where James Wood's uh, character gets up off the couch after he stuck his arm in, in his stomach slit. We had to try to figure out how to do this and we did that, that kind of, it's like an old magician's trick about doing this body out at an angle. We actually had James Wood's on the couch but to sell it that he, that he could get up and glue this appliance arm that came out and bent and went into this stomach slit. Boy, it didn't really look bad because it's shrunk so much. I mean, it was like half the size of his other arm. You know? And it was bouncing around all over the place like a rubber arm. You know, it didn't, wasn't too good. You know? David's script called for Max Wren to hallucinate his way through an escalating series of transformations including several that involved a missing handgun which would reappear with a vengeance. Tom Hester, who was one of the young guys who worked for me at the time, was, that was more his effect, the handgun stuff. Again, we, you know, this gun had to grow onto his hand, as I think it said in the script, and it was like, how does that happen? And then, and then it becomes, you know, becomes part of his hand, and just this flesh thing. So, I mean, I did these, had the idea of doing these, you know, tenderly things that are like metallic that grow out of the gun and through his fingers and into his uh, veins and stuff. And, and so the first version of the gun is, is that. And we had an, an effect hand that we had these tendril things come out and go into. And uh, then we had this other one that was just this more meaty, fleshy, fatty thing that was a big appliance that shoots these cancerous tumors. One of my favorite shots in Videodrome is also one of the simplest. The day before we were scheduled to shoot the latest confrontation between Max and his increasingly hostile television set, David asked whether we could come up with some sort of transitional effect between the real video image and Rick's flesh TV appliance. Rick's team built a variant on the engulfing TV screen in Max's apartment, while Lee Wilson and I worked out a front projection process using a series of graduated filters which allowed us to generate and fade out an on-set TV image without expensive post-production opticals. In fact, the toughest part of the shot was talking production into spending the unbudgeted $300 we needed to film, process, and print the projection clip in time for the next day's shoot. Video drone is death. There's a number of things in the movie that look like like sexual organs. You know? uh, in fact, there were, this is the whole ending that that we prepared for that where uh, Debbie Harry and and, uh, and James Woods had these weird sex organ the hands that, that and there was this weird sex scene with their hands with all this stuff that and I, I remember the day that we were supposed to shoot that and and Steve Johnson and I getting all set up and we had all the sex organs laid out on the, on the uh, table and all our glues and all this stuff and, and then the door opened up and we thought it was going to be James Woods or, or Debbie Harry and it was David saying, don't put this stuff on yet, I, I'm, 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 I'm rethinking this. So we sat there and then we, we didn't do anything that day and we ended up never, never using those and we came up with a, a different ending, uh, like I said, ever, ever mutating. The unpleasant death of Barry Convex was designed as a tour de force by Rick Baker and his assistant Steve Johnson, and it provided yet another opportunity for all three effects units to come together, along with anyone else on the set who had nothing better to do that day than get unbelievably bloody. Especially in those days, we would make something, and like I said, we, we didn't spend a lot of time on the, on the control system for it, you know. Uh, usually because we didn't have the time to spend on it, you know, we were just happy to get the thing done, you know. Then it was like, oh my God, we have to work this thing, and how does that work, you know, and, and you know, kind of the simplest way for a lot of these things to work was you get a bunch of guys with their hands stuck on into something or 
pulling a cable that's connected to this and the effect where Barry Convex is coming apart. We had, you know, people under the set with their hands in these hot melt vinyl cancer puppets that had to come up and we had and remember had we guys we had guys who were the arms of it and somebody else working some other part of the head and doing these things and those days it was just like, hey we need somebody else to work this thing. Go you know grab uh, grab somebody and you know come over here and and for many years it's like that and it's still like that in some in some shows that we do. You know, you would think that there is a lot of choreography involved with it, but a lot of times it's just kind of catch as catch can too, you know. It's like you do end up spending a lot of times in uncomfortable positions with your arms shoved up in something and, and get a lot of goo on you and stuff, you know. I remember after we shot that Barry Convex body, you know, all of us coming going back to the hotel completely covered in this, you know, fake blood, this carol syrup blood that's sticky as hell, you know, and our shirts are stuck to us and we got it in our hair and we're just you know, look like we were been in some horrible accident, and all of a sudden there's like you know half a dozen guys, bloody guys, coming into this posh hotel where you have all these ladies with their mink coats on, kind of looking at us like, what the hell are these guys doing here? You know. 1981 was drawing to a close. In the effects shop, the decorations were strung in the unlikely hope that we'd make it home for the holidays. There were still several tricky sequences to complete, and very little time left in which to do them. The deadline was Christmas Eve. So there was a uh, tremendous pressure for us to uh, to be done. Essentially, I mean, I suppose technically we had till midnight on December 31st, but uh, for humane reasons, uh, we wanted to be done before Christmas. And we worked some horrendously long days in order to, to get everything done uh, under that uh, sort of Christmas Eve deadline. The days leading up to Christmas would turn out to be the longest on the production as we prepared to shoot the final scenes in the movie. A special interior set had been built for one last explosive encounter between Max and his Videodrome TV. It was an encounter that would live in infamy from that day until this, in the memories and olfactory bulbs of pretty much everybody within breathing distance of the set on that final night. This was uh, one of the culminating moments of the, of the movie and the story, and a lot of R&D went into uh, And for the brains that were going to come flying out of the TV set through an air cannon, um, the special effects coordinator had selected uh, sheep guts as an appropriate um, substitute for an actual human brain, which apparently wasn't available. We were across the street from an abattoir. I went, I knocked on the door, I told them what I wanted, I told them why I wanted it, fully expecting to be sent away, and in fact, he said, come back in 15, 20 minutes. And uh, I remember he sent me away, he said, go and get some green garbage bags. Uh, I went back. They filled the green garbage bags as they were gutting pigs, and they brought them back to me. He, he'd acquired it, uh, you know, on uh, for the time on which we'd scheduled it, but we didn't get around to shooting it till at least a week or so later. And the sheep got sat in a green garbage bag beside the set until they were required. And when that bag was opened. Um, well, if you ever want to empty a, a very full room quickly, uh, decaying sheep guts is a hell of a way to do it. I warned the production manager, the producer, and David what we were about to do, and they were fine with it. So at the last minute, we, we gloved up. We put a breakaway glass screen in. We loaded the guts into the air cannon, and the rest is history. Once we overcame the, the stench and could function in the room with the sheep guts, he loaded the air cannon with them and uh, we had a bunch of cameras running. And when the charge went off, um, all I remember is basically nothing came out, but one errant piece of sheep gut managed to splatter itself against one of the lenses of a camera. Uh, and it basically did everything it wasn't supposed to do. And we all sort of sat around dumbfounded and said, well, you know, we, we're going to have to do this again. And youth, um, doesn't help you. It is not your friend at that point in time. You have the eyes uh, and the judgment of 50 or 60 crew members, producers, production managers, who are the money people. It is their money you are spending, or in that instance, wasting. At that point in the day, um, most people's sense of humor is pretty much gone. I think we'd already passed our 12th hour, and if I'm not mistaken, it was at least four, if not six hours before the cannons were really reloaded and the cameras reset, and we shot it again. Under those circumstances, if you're responsible for that, you don't want it to not work a second time. So I remember very clearly cranking uh, those valves wide open. The second time, whether the explosives took the screen out or not, that air cannon was about to take them out, and it did. <laughs> 
blood guts went everywhere. It was a punishingly long day, and it was now uh, something like 7 a.m. on Christmas Eve morning. That evening, my, my family had, a, had a, a Christmas Eve dinner planned, and my brother still claims I passed out in the soup, but I think, I think that's a metaphor, and I think that's a bit of a, an urban myth, but uh, I, uh, I was beyond exhausted, and the, the smell of sheep got still in my nostrils. The main and visual effects units wrapped at the end of 1981, only to come together once again in the spring of 82 for a week of pickup shots and inserts. Stuff we didn't have time to complete the previous year, and new footage reflecting the evolution that had taken place in the cutting room. It was cut together in a manner that, was, that made it more than what we had shot. It was the expression, the sum of the whole, it was greater than the individual parts. And it's, uh, the movie has really stood the test of time. It's a, it's a classic. Uh, anybody who's seen it remembers it. I think all the concepts that are explored are very relevant for today. And uh, it's just the technology which has changed. You know, I mean, David has some really good original ideas. And not a lot of people in Hollywood do these days. You know, So it was, uh, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's kind of an interesting film. The best thing I can say to you is that I don't know who Max Wren is, but when we see the picture in the end, I think we'll find out, and hopefully it'll be cohesive, and I, I, I think it will. Well, I haven't written the ending yet, so I can't really tell you. Uh, ask me next time.